Welcome everybody to Menlo's Local Heroes, where we are incredibly passionate about spreading hope right here in the Bay Area and beyond. My name is Michael Reyes. I am the South Bay Outreach Director here at Menlo Church. And if it's your first time with us, I want to invite you to go ahead and to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Every time we upload content, sermons, uh, local hero spotlights, inspiring content will be sent directly to you each time once you subscribe. So make sure to, su to subscribe to Menlo's YouTube channel. Today, you guys, we have an awesome, powerful, and inspiring interview for you guys. I have the opportunity to uh, uh, interview my buddy Fred, who has been a local community community advocate right here in the Silicon Valley for many years. He's done a lot of awesome things. He's been a professor at Santa Clara University at De Anza College. He's taught courses on diversity, educational leadership, amongst other things. He's been the CEO of various organizations and he's led teams. He's grown healthy teams. And right now he's doing awesome work with child advocates of Silicon Valley. Fred, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm glad you're here. Thanks, Michael. It's great to be here. Awesome. Well, let's jump just straight into it, Fred. Before, um, I want to talk about the foster care system. I want to talk about what you guys do. But before a child here in Santa Clara County is placed into the foster care system, what does that process look like? What, what leads up to that decision? So the sad news is that um, the reason a child enters foster care in Santa Clara County is because they've been the victim of child abuse, neglect, or abandonment. And the courts had to intervene in their care and custody. So they enter what's called the dependency court in Santa Clara County. And they're assigned a lawyer. They're assigned a social worker. They're assigned a lot of, of folks to serve them and, and to, um, to represent them in the court. And so that the court can make the best decisions possible. Now, they may be removed from their home Im immediately. And they may be returned to their home. Let's say there's domestic violence. And parents are split up, the child may stay in the home with one parent. The child could stay with a relative if there's a safe relative um, that can, that the court will approve. Or third, the child may actually go into a foster care placement. Hmm. So all children have been abused, neglected, or abandoned. So through no fault of their own, they are now in the dependency court system. Um, and the court is gonna be trying to reunify that family and in those cases where reunification is impossible, the child will then be moved to either adoption or guardianship or some other placement. So, um, so some forever home, hopefully, for that child. So reunification is our goal. Uh, but when that's not possible, then the best placement possible for that child. Wow. So just to summarize, so, so the number one goal is to keep the child in the home and they work with the family. If that's not possible, the second choice is a relative or a friend who is close like a relative, keeping the child uh, at least close to the family. And if that's not possible, the foster care system is, is the third option. And that's when kids uh, are put into the system. The, all three of them are there in the system, but just foster care is their placement if they're actually in that part of it. But they're in foster care, even if they're with their parents, because the court is still overseeing what's happening with that family. Mm. And at any given time, I mean, right here in Santa Clara County, about how many kids are in the foster care system and um, just various regions. If you, have, if you have a story that you can share with us as to, um, you know, why they end up in the foster system. Yeah, unfortunately, probably about 1,200 kids in our county are in the foster care system wow. in the dependency court. And that means that they have, it's been substantiated that they've been abused, neglected, or abandoned. Um, and so oftentimes it's a situation where drugs, alcohol, um, domestic violence has happened under the stress of a family. And so hopefully reunification um, can happen with a family going into treatment, getting clean and sober, getting counseling, getting parenting classes, really working on their family to get healthy again and to, and to reestablish healthy relationships with their children. And then sometimes that's just really not possible. Parents might get incarcerated. Um, mm. Parent may have already been gone from the family. Parent may get incarcerated. So you have really no parents to take care of that child. Um, and so we can have some super sad, very tragic kinds of cases. Um, but I think that the challenge that we face is not to be focused just on the tragedy of what the child's gone through, but to not let that stop us from saying, so what are we going to do now? How are we going to strengthen support 
and nurture this child as they go through this system in order to mitigate as much as we can the trauma that they've experienced. So lots of kids can come out of this system in really healthy kinds of ways. Um, other kids, it's a it's much harder um, experience. I, I'll give you an example. We have a 15-year-old young man. I'll call him Eddie. And he was given up to, by his biological parents when he was about five. Mm -hmm. So that he went into the system, the court intervened and care, his care and custody. Um, and he was up for adoption and he got adopted when he was about six years old. And he lived with that family for about five years. Um, and then his adopted family gave him up. And a lot of it is behavioral stuff. A lot of it is his own. He was pre-exposed to drugs and alcohol. So he has his own challenges. But then to go back into the system at 13, 14 years old and then be in the system, he's now try he was out of school. He was suicidal. He was running away. Um, and so our intervention helped stabilize him, get him back on track. Um, and he still has challenges. He's going to counseling. He's on medication, whatever but he's getting the systems working for him. He's mm -hmm. getting the resources and services that he needs. Um, and now he's doing much better. He's in school again. He has a new girlfriend. He's, <laughs> he's, really, he's really getting his, his life together in a different kind of a way. And so even with real tragedy, we see all kinds of possibilities of opportunity and hope. Man, that is so awesome to hear. So that's, let's get into that a little bit more. So you're the CEO of Child Advocates of Silicon Valley. And so we talked about the process and, you know, the problems that are going on. You gave the example of Eddie. Where does Child Advocates come in and what kind of support does Child Advocates give to all the kids um, that you're working with? Yeah, that's a great question and one I'm excited about. So at Child Advocates, we provide services to kids from zero to 21 who are in the dependency court in Santa Clara County. So only Santa Clara County and um, only kids in the dependency court, zero to 21. Um, and what we believe is the best intervention is to have an adult who cares about that child to help them walk through that process. So we have what's called a court appointed special advocate or CASA who is appointed by the court to be able to be that mentor to that child through this system. Mm -hmm. So we, as child advocates, we recruit, we train, they go through 30 hours of training. Right now it's all virtual. Um, and then we support ongoingly. Our staff supports that volunteer who gets assigned by the, and appointed by the court. So they actually have a court order. They're a court appointed special advocate. And basically they have three roles. One, as a volunteer, they work as a mentor with the child. They spend time with the child, having fun, you know, going places, doing things. Right now they're doing that virtually, um, but they're still building that mentor relationship with the young person. Secondly, they are the advocate for the child in the system, right? So the system is not always perfect. So you might have a social worker who's great, and that social worker may get transferred and you may get a new social worker. Mm. I may not even know the social worker. Wow. The CASA really is the person who can, knows the child and can advocate for them within the system. So I have glasses, right? Does the kid have glasses? Does he need glasses? What's going on with his glasses? The social worker's order says he's supposed to have them. He doesn't have them. The advocate is like, hey, what's going on? getting that child the services that they need, what are the resources that they benefit from. It's the advocate's job to be vo that voice in the system itself. And then finally, they report directly to the court. So all our advocates do a written report to the court and they can, at this point virtually now, but they still can appear in the court to talk to the judge directly about how the child's doing and any of the recommendations that the court is gonna make they can be better informed because someone has that kid's back. Somebody is there who knows the child. And oftentimes the court will say, the judges are making very difficult decisions about the future of the child's life. And the judge will often say, okay, Casa, what's your thoughts? Like, mm. what is going on with this child? What is the child's preferences? What do you think is in best interest? And so the child has a lawyer, the child has a social worker, but they won't necessarily know the child as well as their CASA. So we say, you show up for the child as the mentor. 
you stand up for the child in the system wow. to understand what the system's needs are, the child's needs are in the system. And then you lift up that child both from an emotional, spiritual kind of space to be like really lifting them up as a child, but also lifting them up to the court to let the court understand really what's going on with this child and how can the court then make more informed decisions. And as I say, some of the most difficult decisions that judges have to make, um, at least they're more informed by somebody who actually knows the child, who doesn't have the bias of what they're getting out of it. Right. Remember, these are volunteers. So they have a tremendous amount of credibility, especially with our older kids who have become jaded, who are questioning the system and mm -hmm. how they should trust an adult or not. And they will say to the CASA, well, what are you getting out of this? You're a volunteer, you're not getting paid, right? <laughs> but they know everyone else is getting paid. And yeah. then there's one person who keeps showing up for them um, to be there just for them. And it's an experience that hopefully all of us have in our lives. But unfortunately, in this case, um, many of our kids don't have. Um, so that's really what the role of a CASA is. Uh, that, to me, the most amazing and enlightening thing that you just pointed out is it's amazing how in these cases, there's lawyers involved, there's a social worker assigned to the kids. And, and myself, before I met you, even thought, hey, this is the social worker's job. But making the point, making it clear, social workers get transferred different cases, they go different places, they don't even stick with the kid long enough to see this process through. And um, man, that, that has been the most enlighten, enlightening thing to learn from you, the need and the necessity of having these volunteers become child advocates so this kid has that consistent presence in their life, somebody fighting for them um, throughout this whole process. That's just amazing. Exactly. We think of ourselves as justice partners. So we mm. partner with the social worker. We partner with the lawyer to be able to help. How do we get this kid the stuff that he needs? And for social workers who have a, you know, a really heavy schedule and a heavy uh, caseload, we might be able to, be able to support their plan to be able to get those services, follow up, take them to that appointment, get some of the stuff done so that the social worker and the lawyers work in partnership together with us um, our CASAs can be pretty effective at helping to get um, those services that the social workers plan may call for. Uh, yeah. But you know, squeaky wheel, you got to have somebody that's in your, in your corner really speaking up for you to get the system to move in the direction that we need it in. Yeah. So you said there's about 1,200 kids right now, Santa Clara mm -hmm. County in the foster care system. Do we have, I love what you're doing. It all sounds great. But if we were to look at this program and not see any results, then it would be, you know, hey, what's going on here? How can we improve what's, you know, what's the goal of, of what we're doing? Do we have evidence of a tangible difference between foster care kids who don't have a child advocate and foster care kids who do have a child advocate? Yeah, unfortunately, the numbers are terrible for foster kids, right? So our numbers are way better, but it's still like, to me, the challenge is all foster kids really need more support. Yeah. Um, but we know that, for example, within our high school kids that we support with CASAs, their graduation or completion of high school rate is about in the high 90%. If you look at typical foster kids in the system, they're more, like, more likely to complete high school at about 60%. In terms of the enrollment in preschool for our little ones, about 75 to 80% of our kids will be enrolled in a preschool. Whereas if a child was just in foster care without a CASA, it's about 25%. Wow. So you can see some really dramatic differences, but just think about it. It's somebody who's advocating for you. So you have a four-year-old and you're like, well, why aren't you in preschool, right? It's just asking those logical questions. Well, there's a lot of steps that have to happen. Well, yeah, that's where a CASA can be. We have kids that have special ed needs, right? And so again, if you're not at the IEP meeting, if you don't know what the kid needs, you're gonna, that child's not, they're gonna be one of the kids that falls through the cracks. We saw a lot of that during COVID with kids going to distance learning and their CASAs are the ones that got them the laptop, got them the school supplies, got them you know, connected to their schools, really have been their advocate within the system to make sure that they would continue to be successful as learners. So wow. typically kids that have CASAs get lots more services and they get the services that they need that are in their plan. 
they've been assessed, we know what they need. Um, and so CASAs take charge of that plan and are able to then say, yeah, this kid needs these things. How do I go do that? And our staff and child advocates supports them in helping them to figure out how do we get those things met, either in the system, in terms of resources, or that we supply directly. Wow, that is amazing. About, about how many kids right now um, have a child advocate in Santa Clara County? How many are waiting uh, on the waiting list for a child so advocate? Of all the kids, some kids probably aren't going to need a CASA, right? They're only going to be in the court a short amount of time, for example, or mm. um, they're, they're just waiting for adoption, things like that. They're in good space. So we have about 600 kids in care right now who have CASAs. Wow. And our waiting list fluctuates, but it runs around 200, 250 kids. Some kids leave the court, some kids enter every month, but we think we have about 250 kids who need CASAs, who could benefit from CASAs that we have a waiting list for. So trying to recruit CASAs is one of our major jobs to be able to get them through our training, to get them to graduate and get appointed by the court, and then take an assignment where they work directly with the child. Um, so yeah, so we serve about 600 kids, but we probably have a good 200, 250 kids that really would benefit from a CASA. Man, so, so there's a need. Um, one of the reasons we're doing this, uh, you know, here at Menlo Church, we just believe in, in living a life of service, impacting the local community. And so, um, so right now to everybody who's listening, um, can you give them a couple ways on, on how they can get involved and support um, uh, the organization you're running and support these kids? Well, first of all, I think that one of the things I just described is we have the store and the store is in our office and it has toys, clothes, toiletries, school supplies, books, art supplies, all the kinds of things that our CASAs need to work with our kids. So rather than them going out and buying them, they come to the store and they get, you know, Uno game or they get, you know, Connect Four or they get sports equipment or the kid needs shoes or clothes or toiletries, things that the child may need that they're, again, the system isn't providing or providing right now. Um, and so the store is a really good example of how our CASAs can really tangibly take that basketball to the kid and go play basketball. Good in the old, good old days when they could go to a park. <laughs> <laughs> but the store really becomes our hub for those kinds of things. So folks be able to participate in the backpack drive where we have the need for school supplies, all of our kids are gonna need school supplies in the fall, right? Mm -hmm. And we want them to feel proud and excited about going to school. So first day of school clothes and having your new backpack and having all the supplies you need, really we wanna just set this mindset for our young people that school is exciting, people care about you and people care about school. We have other needs in the store of things like toiletries and other items that kids need on an ongoing basis Shoes, clothes, gift cards can always help. We have an Amazon list of things that we need. So being able to participate in the a backpack drive right now is just outstanding because that'll really help us get our kids ready for school in the fall. Um, and as I say, it's really just a mindset of everyone's excited about you starting fourth grade or you're starting high school or you're gonna be in your senior year, whatever. And those that kind of brand new backpack stuff that always makes it a little bit more exciting, but it just is the, it's the symbol that somebody cares. Mm. Somebody is saying, you're not only important, but your education's important and we're gonna do everything we can to stand behind you and support you to help you to be successful in those kinds of ways. So participating in a backpack drive will be huge for us. Um, and it'll really set on that trajectory of how do we keep kids engaged in school and how do we keep them excited about learning and giving them, give another example to them of the belief that we believe you can do it. We believe education is important, but it's really important for you. You're, you're going to be able to be successful in school. Awesome. So Backpack Drive, we're doing that August 8th, Menlo Church. Um, we're going to do it uh, all campus wide. The South Bay campuses are doing it. Mountain View, Saratoga, San Jose. It's going to be a great event. I'm going to make sure to put that information there. Um, but how else? Is there another way that um, child advocates or everybody listening can get involved with child advocates? I think or that's, that's just, yeah, the second ahead. way is, the, is becoming a volunteer yourself, yeah. right? Is becoming a CASA. And CASAs do not have to have training beforehand. They don't have to be experts. 
These are just normal citizens, residents of our community, folks that live here who want to make a difference in a foster kid's life. Now, mm. you have to have your own stuff in order to be able to give that to somebody else, right? To be having the stability to be able to face challenges. These kids are not necessarily going to come with all, you know, the bow tied up. They're going to have challenges. They're going to be just typical kids who've got challenges growing up. And so our volunteers really have to have that spirit of opportunity and hope to come in and say, I'm going to go through the training. You have a ton of support. You are never alone. You always have the, the support of our staff to help you go through any situation that you're in. We have the resources for the store. We have different activities that we do with the kids, lots of fun things that can happen. We give you a lot of support, but it's really about a volunteer stepping up and saying, yes, I want to make a difference in the child in a child's life who's had to go through this through no fault of their own have ended up in the court system. And I want to just see what I can do to help make that difference. So that's really the other big way is to actually become a volunteer CASA and to take on um, the, the role of a CASA with an individual foster kid. That's awesome. So donating to the store, um, just items that you need, donating uh, school materials August 8th on the backpack drive, uh, and actually becoming a, a CASA, a child advocate, volunteering to do that. To everybody who's listening right now, uh, I'm going to make sure the links for all those are in, in the description of wherever this video was posted. And um, I also want to ask anybody who's listening, um, just to ask yourself, if you feel that you are in a place uh, to become a child advocate, to partner with, with Fred and, and the whole organization, um, just to help walk alongside these children in need. Um, just ask yourself that, click on the link and just learn more. Um, I, Fred, just with talking with you, seeing the organization, you guys are a healthy organization. You provide the right information. You know, you're gonna work with all the volunteers properly. They're not gonna feel alone or by themselves. Um, this isn't becoming a foster parent, you know, so it's not yeah. that at all. Right. Um, so anybody listening, just ask yourself if you're in a place to volunteer your time uh, to help these kids who are in the foster system right here in Santa Clara County. All right, Fred. So before we wrap up, let's just do, let's just do a quick lightning round. I got a few more questions for you um, and then we will be on our way. So first question for you in the last 20 years, how have you seen the foster care system improve? I think the courts super much more informed about trauma informed care. They understand adverse childhood experiences. So they have a much better understanding of what the kids are going through mm -hmm. and therefore what should we do to help support them and help change that trajectory. So I see lots of progress in how the court's understanding kids and the challenges that they face. That's awesome. In the next 20 years, where would you like to see the foster care system? You know, the miracle would be if it doesn't exist in 20 years, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't have kids that are abused or neglected or abandoned. Mm. But what I think was probably um, my vision would be that our numbers are super low, that we've worked on our prevention strategies. So we reduce the number of kids in the, in the system and we particularly reduce the number of kids who are, who are kids of color, that there's a disproportionate number of kids of color in the system. Yeah. And so 20 years from now, I would hope that that's, that's gone and that we have less kids because we're doing a so much better job at prevention, mm. and supporting families uh, in our community. And I know we can do that. Um, so that would be our goal is to have less kids in the system um, and definitely less kids of color in the system. Fred, man, I love that. I just got goosebumps. Our church uh, for the past many weeks has been talking about how can we get involved? Diversity is a, a huge topic right now because of the state of our nation, what's been going on. Um, but we've been looking for practical ways to get involved um, with a diverse population. How can we help? And I just see this, this is an opportunity to practically make an impact um, uh, in that issue going on. So man, that is so awesome. Last question, as the CEO of Child Advocates of Silicon Valley, what is uh, one thing that you are most proud of that you guys have accomplished in the last 12 months or so? I'm going to take my privilege, Michael, and say there's two things. Um, one is that um, we were able to, with the support of the community, meet the essential needs of kids during COVID. Mm. We assessed 250 of our kids right away. We, we really took charge of how do we get those kids food, clothing, supplies that they needed, computers to go to school, 
all the kinds of things that they needed in that pandemic. And we got to step up and really take, take charge of those things so our kids did not suffer. I think the second thing is we rebranded our organization, which is, is not a big deal, except the reason I'm proud of it is because it gave us better access and we have more people volunteering. So the branding, getting our communication, moving our message out there in a better way has triggered more volunteers stepping forward. So those are two things that I'm super excited about, that we could step up for kids in the day-to-day -day pandemic and that we are bringing more people into the system to help our kids. Man, Fred, that is, that is so awesome. Uh, as the outreach director here at Menlo for the South Bay, uh, I have the opportunity to meet so many organizations, so many different people. And to be honest, there's some organizations that I walk into and I meet and uh, you can see it's disorganized. You know, the mission isn't clear. Uh, the team is not on board. And, and I walk out of those meetings. I'm like, man, I wish we could partner with these guys, but it'd be very difficult. Um, but then there's other organizations that uh, the leadership is there. The team is there. The mission is clear. And and there's uh, you're making an impact. And, and Fred, I really believe that Child Advocates of Silicon Valley is one of those organizations that I'm looking forward to partnering with, especially with this upcoming Backpack Drive um, on August 8th. And then also, um, I can't wait to see our congregants. I know Menlo Church congregants are going to step up to the plate and, and uh, sign up to become some child advocates. So, Fred, I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much for your leadership with Child Advocates of Silicon Valley, man. Thank you so much, Michael. It's been great talking to you today. And I welcome the chance to welcome Menlo um, church participants to into the fold. I'd love to see a, a huge number of CASAs coming from Menlo. I think that'd be just that, that's just cherry on the top. And then everybody would understand this system a lot better. And the more you understand, the more we can make changes together. So thanks for this great opportunity. Well, thank you, Fred. Child Advocates of Silicon Valley. You guys, that's the name of the organization. Uh, and I promise you, anybody listening, if you decide to become a child advocate right here in Santa Clara County, uh, you will be a local hero. Uh, remember, if you're watching this for the first time, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll be uh, sent this good content uh, directly each time. Share this video, tag Menlo so we can see you watching it and sharing it if you find it informative. Uh, leave some comments in the, in the description below for us. And everybody remember, no matter what our community is facing, there is always hope because anything is possible. Fred, thank you so much for joining us. To everybody listening, we'll see you next time.